Praise the Lord. Agege people, I said, praise the Lord. Wonderful to be here again. Looks like every time I come, there's improvement everywhere. And I want to know more. Everybody, I said, praise the Lord. Those who are outside, let me see your face. Wave that hand at me and then say, praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for bringing us to the Bible study today. You know, we're starting all over again and Agege happens to be one. And uh, the reason why you are one is alphabetically, you know, as we arrange all the districts, alphabetically, Agege comes as number one. And then we're starting a new book today. Uh, so that you are the one to lead us in the way in the new book we are looking at. And today you will know more. More about Jesus, more about love, and more about his truth, and more about the calling the Lord has given us. And this day, a new thing will happen in your life in Jesus' name. And then from here, from this place again here, the water of life will flow to the rest of the world. We're going to pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. We bless your name because of new days, new epistle we're looking at. I was asking, Lord, today that your word will come fresh to every life in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see. Open our understanding to understand. I will pray, Lord, you empower your people, enlighten your people in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to 2 John. That is the second epistle of John. And uh, you will see the peculiarity of this second epistle of John. We're reading from verse 1. It has only one chapter. And today we're looking at verses 1 through to 6. We're looking at 2 John chapter 1, verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be in us with us forever. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. As you look at all those verses I've read to you now, you'll find one word coming over and over again. And it's the word truth. The truth. Here John reminds us the centrality of the truth. The power of the truth. The priority of the truth. The primacy of the truth. The preeminence of the truth. As we look at the verses tonight, we're going to study this under the subject, under the title, The Preeminence of Divine Truth. The Preeminence of Divine Truth. If there is anything that shall interest anyone worshipping the Lord, anyone coming near to the Lord, anyone that is reading the Bible, studying the Bible, analyzing the Bible, and wanting to apply the Bible to his life, is that word the truth. In fact, as you look at the Bible, you're going to find out that this word, truth, is very central. The Bible tells us that God is a God of truth. It tells us that Jesus Christ is a truth. It tells us that the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. And then it tells us that the Bible is the scripture of truth. It tells us that the message of the word and what we read is the word of truth. 
He gives us the law and he says it's the law of truth. And then he tells us that the way we follow, the way from earth to heaven, the way we have chosen which leads us out of sin and to the savior and to the supernatural, he says the way of truth. And then he says the law and everything we're looking at as we come to preach. If we're going to be any preacher that amounts to anything in the sight of the Lord, he said we're the preachers of the truth. Not only that, it says that we then are men and women of truth. And so you'll find as you look at your Bible, it will not surprise you that John the Beloved is concentrating on the truth. And it says that this truth is what should occupy our attention. As he's writing, he's writing as an elder. What does that mean, elder? You know that John the Beloved was an apostle. But he was the last of the apostles to die. It was now the end of the first century. And uh, it was around 95 AD to 96 AD. And John the Beloved was already more than 90 years of age. All the other apostles had died. Paul had died, Peter had died, and James had died. All the others have died and remained just John the Beloved. And now as the oldest one of the people that saw Jesus Christ the truth face to face, he comes to them and he says, I'm writing to you, lady and the children, I'm writing to you as the elder. Now you'll find First John was a general epistle. Reaching to everyone, reaching to the whole church. But as you come to a second John, it's reaching to a family. This uh, lady, because the husband is not mentioned at all, theologians tell us, is uh, probably a widow. And then her children, this nucleus of a family, this lady and the children, this widow and the children, they were the recipients of this epistle. As you come to the third epistle, you'll find it was written to girls, a man. The first epistle, general. And the second epistle, to a family. And the third epistle, written to an individual. And then he tells us about the truth. Look at this. He says the elder, that's John, that's the apostle, that's the aged one. He says the elder unto the elect lady. Elect lady. That means a chosen lady. That means the one. Many are called, but few are chosen. And this lady had had the call of the Lord. The call to salvation. The call to repentance. The call to come to the Savior. And she had, re she had repented and responded to that call. The call to salvation. And so she was chosen. She was elected. She was selected and she was brought into relationship with the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then now it says, the elder unto the, unto the elect lady and her children. And her children. Isn't it wonderful that even though the Father was not there, yet the children had followed the way of the Lord. And had followed the word of truth. And had followed the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth, the way, and the life. And John was so happy writing to them. Writing to the whole family. The lady and her children. And he says, so my love in the truth. You know John? John hated Aaron. If you remember in First John he said, There's a spirit of truth and a spirit of Aaron. And then he said, anyone that doesn't believe, that doesn't have this truth, he says, we have nothing to do with him or with her. And then he says, not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. He says, I'm not the only isolated one. The only one that knows the truth and loves the truth and believes the truth, it says the other people too that know the truth and believe the truth, accept the truth, the totality and touch of the word of God. And it says we all love this lady and her children. And then it says for the truth's sake, for the truth's sake. It says I'm writing for the truth's sake. I love that lady for the truth's sake. 
I love her children for the truth's sake. It says, I do nothing except because of the truth. No relationship except because of the truth. There's no interaction except because of the truth. It says, I'm writing to you for the sake of the truth. I love your children for the sake of the truth. I remember you for the sake of the truth. I emphasize the word for the sake of the truth. It says everything I do everywhere I go and whoever I contact is because of the truth for the sake of the truth which dwelleth in us. It says it's not just in a book somewhere. It dwells inside us. It's in our heart. It's in our mind. We live by that truth and because of that truth that dwelleth in us and shall be with us how long was you forever it will be with us forever and some people they believe the truth temporarily and they have the truth just be a few months a few years and then something happens in their lives and then they go into error and here the apostle the elder he says and it shall be with us forever they always remember we came into the kingdom of god by grace we're saved by grace we're sustained by grace we're supported by grace and it's only the grace of god that makes us to say we're the children of God and the elected lady is the grace of God. Children of the lady is the grace of God and even the elder that is writing this is the grace of God and it says grace be with you. We're saved by grace and that grace did not leave us there and say okay bye bye. Now that you are saved you can continue on your own. It's still that same grace that will sustain us and support us and help us to keep on living the life, the life of Christ that we ought to live. And then it says mercy. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Grace is giving us what we do not deserve. And mercy is not giving us what we deserve. We deserve punishment. It doesn't give us that's mercy. And we deserve judgment. It doesn't give us judgment. That's mercy. And we deserve rebuke. Everlasting eternal rebuke. And it doesn't do that. Grace draws us in. And then mercy wipes the tears away. And it says, I know what you deserve. I know what you deserve. You deserve eternal judgment, eternal punishment. But there's mercy. That's why those people cried, Son of David, have mercy on us. Grace saves us. And then mercy removes the judgment away from us. And then it says, and peace, and peace. What does that mean? We're being in conflict with the Lord as sinners. Because sinners are enemies of God. There is no peace, says the Lord, and says the word for the weekend. But now we come to the Lord and Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And because he's the Prince of Peace, it takes the conflict in our hearts away. It takes the enmity between between a sinful man and the holy God, he takes that enmity away, and now there is peace. And then all the storms in our lives, he says, peace be still, and the peace of God will multiply in your life. And so he says, he tells us about the grace, and about the mercy, and about the peace, and it's coming from God, and it's coming from the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, the Son of the Father, then he says, in truth and in love in truth and in love now john did not recognize any love that does not have any element of truth and john did not recognize any truth that didn't have the divine love it says it's going to be truth and love not truth without love not love without truth they are together. The truth and the grace coming from the Lord and the love coming from him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You'll have it in Jesus' name. And now John says, I rejoice greatly. I rejoice greatly. Think of what will bring joy to an elder. What will bring joy to an apostle. All his friends are gone. Peter is gone. James is gone and Matthew is gone all the other apostles are gone this man will be a lonely man 
This man will be an isolated man. He says, I don't see anybody. And then because of age, he might not even be enjoying physical things like food and all those things. And there's no sight that interested him. He said, there's only one thing remaining. When I see people walking in the truth, living in the truth and living by the truth, he says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. That's what brings joy to the people who are saved, the people who are sanctified, the people who are children of God. This is what brings joy to their hearts and that's what brings joy today in the heart of a preacher, in the heart of a pastor. When he preaches the truth of salvation and people accept that. When he preaches the truth of holiness and people accept that. And when he preaches the truth of walking according to the word of God and people accept and believe that it says i have no greater joy i rejoice greatly because i found of the children walking in, in the truth who are considering the message the preeminence of divine truth preeminence the preeminence of divine truth there are three things we're going to consider number one the primacy and the wonder of the truth the primacy that means priority the primacy that means the supremacy the primacy, that means the preeminence. The primacy, that means the exalted position of that truth and the wonder of the truth. The primacy and the wonder of the truth. Number two, their progress while walking in the truth. The lady and her children, the church and her members and our people who are here, the progress we make. As we walk in the truth, their progress while walking in the truth. Number three, the precept in the word of truth. The precept in the word of truth. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one over there. The primacy and the wonder of the truth. We're coming to a second John, the second epistle of John. And we're looking at chapter one, verse one. The elder unto the elect lady and her children whom i love in the truth and not i only but also all they that have known the truth then in verse 2 for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us how long forever I pray this truth will be with us forever in Jesus' name. As uh, John, the beloved, wrote, he wrote about the truth. Everything is centered around the truth. Every explanation around the truth. Every exhortation around the truth. Every encouragement around the truth. Every counsel around the truth. Every presentation around the truth. And he emphasizes that. He says, if the truth is the truth is the truth every time. Because this is the preeminent thing. This is the primary thing. And this is the priority. The truth. And you need to begin to think about that in your life. Look at Third John. Third John. Just the next epistle here. It says, the elder unto the well-beloved girls whom I love, tell me, in the truth. Whom I love in the truth. You know what this man is saying? He says, I don't care about their money. I don't care about their property. I don't care about their position. I don't care about their beauty. I don't care about anything. I care about the truth. I love them not because they're exalted. I love them not because they're highly placed. I love them not because they're going to give me anything. I love them whom I love in the truth. Whether it's a woman or a man. Whether it's a new member of the church or an old member of the church. Whether it's a leader or a worker or a member of the church. It says the only thing that connects us together. And what makes me to have that love for them whom I love 
in the truth. And how we ought to be the men of the truth and the women of the truth. The preachers of the truth and the people that appreciate the truth. That the people may be poor but they have the truth. You love them. And the people may be rich and they have the truth and you love them. And it says, I love them in the truth. We're looking at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I read from verse 21. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 21, it says, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. It says the truth I'm talking about is not the truth that has 99% truth and then 1% error. It says, no, I don't allow any adulteration. I don't allow any aberration. Aberration that's going astray and introducing something that is not totally of the truth. It says what I'm looking for is a hundred percent truth because there is no lie in the truth. After all, he said God is true. After all, he said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, the comforter, the spirit of truth whom I will send unto you. After all, he says the way is the way of truth. After all, he said Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the way, the truth and the life. And there's no error in him and there's no darkness in him because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The truth he's talking about is the divine truth, is the supernatural truth. It's the inspired truth. It's the truth revealed from heaven. And it says the totality of the truth and the primacy of that, the preeminence of that, the priority of that is so exalted. There's no other theme. Now, why is John elevating the truth like this? Why is John encouraging the truth like this? Why is John emphasizing the truth like this? Is this because of what the truth does? And because there's no other thing that can do this, what the truth is doing. John, tell me, what do you mean by that? It says, number one, the truth saves. And there's no other way. Error cannot save. False doctrine cannot save. Darkness cannot save. If there's anything that saves at all, it tastes the truth. Look at James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. It says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Saved with the word of truth. Born again with the word of truth. Begotten with the word of truth. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Number one, the truth saves. That's why John said there's no other thing. And there's no other connection between you and I. But that truth. Number two, the truth brings assurance assurance how do you know you are going to get to heaven the only thing that connects you with god is the truth is the word of god you can go to the depths of the sea you can't find god like that you can go to the top of the mountain you can't find god like that you can travel all the all the trajectories of all the world you cannot get the truth like that you cannot get salvation assurance like that how do how are you sure that when you die you'll get to heaven how are you sure that all your sins are forgiven what gives us assurance it is the truth that's why we prize the truth that's why we exalt the truth. That's why we appreciate the truth. Because there's nothing else that can give us assurance except the truth. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 13. Assurance. Assurance and certainty. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word. What? Tell me out loud. Ye heard the word of truth. Ye heard the word of truth. There's no way you'll have salvation without having the truth. You may go to church. You may dance. You may have music, you may have whatever it is. If the truth is not there, all that might just interest you and just make your flesh one kind. But 
There's no salvation there. You cannot have assurance that you are saved, that you are born again, that you are a child of God, that you are going to heaven without the truth. There's some people that say, I go to a particular church. Uh -huh, everybody goes to church nowadays, but what kind of church? And what is said there, what is taught there, is it truth? 100% without darkness, without error, and without any false doctrine. That's what will save. Look at that verse 13 in whom he also trusted. After that, he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after he believed, he was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, the deposit of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of of his glory. That's your assurance right there. It's based on the truth. Number three is the truth that sets free. The bondage of sin is the truth that breaks that. The bondage of sickness and evil spirit is the truth that nullifies that. The bondage of Satan is the truth that cancels that. For you to be free, free in your spirit and free in your soul. And free in your body, and to be free and free indeed, and to be freed a hundred percent, free the moment you are saved, and free as a walk of the Lord, and free in your life in the time of temptation, in a time of trial, for you to have a free cause and a free channel towards heaven is based on the truth. We're looking at John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, I'm reading here from verse 31. It says, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If he continue, if he continue, somebody shout continue. If he continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Look at verse 32. And ye shall know, what's it? Tell me out loud. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know why John concentrates on the truth? He says, I don't want to have a congregation of slaves, slaves of sin, and slaves of evil spirits, and slaves of Satan. I want to be a pastor over people who are free, free from sin. I'm free from society. I'm free from all the things that bind people in the world. And it says, if you're going to be free, set free, it takes the truth. Number one, we're saved by knowing the truth. Number two, we are having assurance because of the truth. Number three is the truth that brings freedom. Number four now, is the truth that purifies purifies we're looking at first peter first peter chapter one i'm reading from verse 22 first peter chapter one verse 22 see ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth you see that you see that that's why john said when you see somebody who has believed the truth, who has accepted the truth, who has responded to the truth, who is walking by the truth, it says, I have no greater joy because when I see people have received the truth, I see people who are saved. I see people who have assurance. I see people who are set free. I see people who are purified. It says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unto unfeigned love of the brethren and then he goes on to say and so that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abides forever the truth saves the truth brings assurance. The truth sets free. The truth purifies. The truth sanctifies. We're looking at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're reading from verse 17 and then we'll jump to verse 19. John 
chapter 17, verse 17. Here Jesus prayed for the believers. These were sick people. These were born again people. These were people that had assurance of eternal life already. And then he prayed and said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Sanctify them. Sanctify them. Through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Through the truth is the truth that sanctifies. That's why this truth is so central. And it's the truth that reveals more and more of the Lord unto us. You know the Lord as Savior? There's more to know. You know him as sanctifier? There's more to know. You know him as a baptizer in the Holy Ghost? There's more to know. You know him as healer? There's more to know. You know him as the sustainer? There's more to know. You know him as deliverer? There's more to know. And it is the truth. The truth of the word that reveals to you who God is and what God can do. And the length and the breadth and the very fact that with God all things are possible. It is the truth. We're looking at uh, John chapter 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. How be each when he, the spirit of truth, is come. You see that? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you, tell me, into all truth. It will guide you into all truth. You know, you know the places they say the Pentecostal churches and the truth is scarce. The truth is rare. The truth is not as abundant as we thought. A, a church that has the spirit, the spirit of truth, that the truth they should emphasize. And it says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not, you know, leave this area. You're ignorant of this, ignorant of that. And you just only know one thing, speaking in tongues. Uh -uh. That's so small. That's so little. It says, when he, the spirit of truth has come. He, the spirit of truth, he emphasizes the truth. He exalts the truth. He rejoices in the truth. And the joy of the spirit of God is to guide you and to lead you into all truth. And he even tells us there in verse 13, and he says, and he shall remind you whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak because he will show you the things to come. You see, that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that if we actually understand, we know the primacy of the truth, the priority of the truth, and the preeminence of the truth, and the exalted position the Lord has given the truth. You know, it's the truth that renews our spirit. You know, sometimes we're weary, sometimes we're tired, Sometimes you are dreary. Sometimes like you are totally dry. Sometimes it's like, can you go on and you are not enjoying your spiritual life? And then here comes the truth and revives you and resurrects you. And then life comes all over again because it's the truth that renews the spirit. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Here we're looking at verse 21. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 21. Ephesians chapter 4, and we read from verse 21. Here is telling us what the truth does for them. In your life, in my life, in our lives in the church. It says, if so be, ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what the truth does, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then in verse 24, and that you put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And it's the truth that grants us victory. 
in the battles of life, battles against temptation, against trials, persecution, problems that come, is the, is the truth that grants us the victory. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins got about with truth. That's it. Stand. You know, you'll not be able to stand firm, stand fast, and stand erect if you don't have the truth. But you put on the truth. You believe the truth. And you walk in the truth. And you put on the belt of truth. And that makes you solid. That makes you stable. That makes you a steadfast believer. It says, stand therefore. Having your loins got about your truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Taking more of the word, more of the truth, you'll be victorious in Jesus' name. What makes us grow? You're a Christian. You start as being a babe in Christ. And then you continue to grow to maturity. What, what does that in our lives? It is the truth. The truth. The truth that leads us to growth. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. It says, speaking the truth. I want to grow. Speaking the truth. You want to be stable in your Christian life. Speaking the truth. You want to be strong. Speaking the truth. You want to be able to confront any danger that poses a threat to your Christian life. Speaking the truth in love. Me grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. You love the truth. You believe the truth. You are walking in the truth. Saved by the truth. Having assurance because of the truth. Set free by the truth. Purified by the truth. Sanctified by the truth. And then you have more and more revelations of Christ of the Lord through the truth. You are renewed in your spirit by the truth. And then you are granted victory. You become a conqueror more than conqueror. By the truth. And then is the truth that leads you to grow. And then without the truth. All you have is damnation. Without the truth. Think about that. This is what the truth does. And it's only the truth that can do that. That's why John the beloved said. Elect lady. I'm writing to you and to your children. And I love you because of the truth. And I'm writing this for the truth's sake. Because if the truth is missing, there'll be no salvation. If the truth is missing, there'll be no sanctification. If the truth is missing, there would only be damnation. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders. With all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish. Deceivableness in them that perish. False doctrine in them that perish. Error in them that perish with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish because they received not, tell me, the love of the truth. They like deception. They love error. They love things that will tinkle their ears. They love falsehood. And they love tradition. It says, in all, with all deceivableness of righteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 11, 
And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe, tell me, a lie. There are people that believe lies. The lie of the devil. The lie of tradition. And the lies of religion. And the lies of demons. They believe a lie and they are damned. Look at verse 12. That they all might be damned. That they all might perish. That they all might go to hell. Who believed not the truth. But had pleasure in our righteousness. We're coming to Second John. And in Second John chapter 1. That's the reason why the apostle concentrates on the truth. And the first four verses, the truth is mentioned in every verse. And it's mentioned two times in verse 1 alone. And then he goes on and he says, I love the truth. I enjoy the truth. And I love the people that delight in the truth. Because of the primacy and the wonder of the truth, divine truth. Point number two, their progress while walking in the truth. We're not just to have the truth and store it in our heads. We're not just to have the truth and just brag, I know the truth. But we're to walk by it. We're to walk in it. We're to live by it. We're to plan our lives on the basis of the truth. We're to associate, interact with the people that have the truth. We're to live day by day, week after week, in our markets, in our schools, in our places of work. We're to walk and live by the truth. And we're to regulate everything we do, everything we say by the truth. And that's how we make progress in our Christian lives. Just day by day, week after week, month after month, and year after year, walking in the truth. Their progress while walking in the truth. Look at verses 3 and 4. First John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Grace be with you and mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. In truth and in love. It says, have you heard of that divine love? The love of God. For God so loved you. That he gave his only begotten son. That as you believe in him. You will not perish but have everlasting love. It says now that's the truth and that's the love. In truth and in love you believe. And then you come into life. Living in the truth. It tells us in verse 4, it says, I rejoice greatly. Not just moderately. I rejoice. I was so excited. I was so happy. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. We're looking at the gospel according to John. The gospel of John. And we're looking at chapter 1, talking about the truth. How we begin in the truth, and then we continue in the truth. John, John chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 14. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld this glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, and tell me out loud, and truth. Full of grace and truth. There's no grace without truth. Some people say, for us, it's only grace, only grace, only grace. How is the grace going to come? It's by the truth. Is the grace going to come? It's going to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the truth. And is the way. And is the life. And the truth of Jesus Christ. And the truth in Jesus Christ. Is what brings the grace into our lives. There is no grace apart from the truth. And there is no truth apart from the grace of God. Look at this again. It says it's full of grace. Grace and full of truth. It says in verse 15, and John, uh, John said, He bear witness of him and, and cried, saying, This was he 
of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Look at verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but tell me, grace and truth. Grace and truth. Always like that. Grace and truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And John is saying, that's what we need. And then he first of all, he mentions grace unto you. And then he mentions another word. It says mercy from the Father and mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ. After we're born again, after we're saved, we need a continuation of that mercy, the mercy of the Lord. That's when we come before the Lord. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly. Once you've heard the word of truth, and it shows you the love of God, and it shows you the goodness of God, and it shows you the impartiality of God, and it tells you that God is no respecter of persons, and that whosoever will may come. Now you can come boldly because grace and truth came into you, and the truth has emboldened you, and the truth makes you to know there's no barrier, there's no demarcation between you and the Lord, and you can come. And so he says, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's why it says, grace be unto you, and mercy, and then it says, and peace. What kind of peace? We're looking at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And I'm reading here from verse 7. Philippians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 7. The peace that passes understanding. Philippians chapter 4. And we we'll read from verse 7. It says in verse 7, And the peace of God which passes all understanding you know what john was saying it says whatever you're going through the fire and the heat of the day the persecution and the pressure the difficulties and the challenges that may come and the things that are thrown at you that will jolt you destabilize you disorganize you that will make you feel there's conflict within and conflict around it says grace be unto you and mercy and peace, the peace of God, that peace will reign in your heart in Jesus' name. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to tell us now about walking in this truth. You've got that word of God, which is the word of truth, which is the law of truth which is the scripture of truth, which is the principle of truth, and as you have got the truth, saved by the truth, sustained by the truth, sanctified by the truth, supported by the truth, energized by the truth. It says, now you walk in the truth. Look at Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, reading from verse 6, in Malachi chapter 2, verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth. The law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. Walked with me in peace and equity. And did turn many from iniquity. That's what the Lord has called us to. And that is the joy of the Christian life. And that's the joy of Christian service. Walking in the truth. Look at the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5. He wants us to walk in love. Yes, he wants us to walk in the light. He wants us to walk in the truth of the word of God. So that every decision you make is by the truth. Every step you take is by the truth. And every action of your hand is by the truth. And every relationship you maintain is by the truth. Every habit you develop 
is by the truth and every action every act is by the truth that's what the lord is saying that you want to take a decision you say what's the truth of god what does the bible say on this what does the scripture say on this and what's the principle in this if i do this is that walking in the truth if I live that life, is that walking in the truth? Well, walk in the truth. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, be ye therefore followers of God as their children and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us. It says, look at Christ, walk like him, talk like him. It says, look at Christ, pray like him and do things like him. It says, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. I pray that this will be our lifestyle in Jesus' name. I thought Agege would say amen there. But looking at uh, First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 6. First John chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, John never forgets himself. He never forgets that walking in the truth is the primary thing. Walking in the truth is the preeminent thing. Walking in the truth is the central thing. And so he keeps on reminding us, walk in the light, walk in love, and walk in the truth, and walk by the word of the Lord. In First John chapter 1 verse 6 it says if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness uh -uh, we lie and not the, and do not the truth but if we walk in the light if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin I pray that you'll be experiencing Jesus' name. Walking in the light. Walking in love. Walking in, in the truth. Walking in, as Christ walked. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, Seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, you are not faint, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. It says, we look at our lives and we look at if there's any remnant of dishonesty there, any remnant of the works of darkness there? Any remnant of something that does not belong to the Savior? We renounce that. We reject that. We refuse that. We cast it away. We throw it away. It says and we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. Not walking in, in the seat. He said, that's the job of unbelievers. You don't want to do the assignment of unbelievers for them. He says, that's the work of those who are going to perish. That's the work of sinners. You don't want to do the work of evil doers for them. He says, you are no more walking in craftiness. It says, no. No, do you what? Handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. Manifestation of the truth. Everywhere you go, you manifest the truth. You declare the truth. You shine forth the truth. And it is that manifestation, is that revelation, and is that beaming force of the truth that actually makes people to know you are devoted to the truth. You are dedicated to the truth and you are directed by the truth and your life is controlled by the truth, by the manifestation of the truth, even to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Walking in the truth. 
How do you do that? Constantly, constantly. Not just haphazardly. You're walking in the truth constantly. You're walking in the truth personally. Personally. You know, it takes your own personal decision and personal efforts to walk. And nobody can move your legs for you. And there is a decision from within. And there is a principle from within. You know that you are going to a particular destination. And your destination is heaven. And personally, you are walking by the truth. And then you are walking by the truth courageously. Courageously. You are not afraid of anyone. Satan, society, sinners neighbors, persecutors, you make up your mind. If they're not going to get to heaven, like Enoch, you will get there. I said you will get there. And therefore, you walk constantly, continually, consistently. And you walk courageously and you walk uncompromisingly. Uncompromisingly. It might be at a great cost. It might be at a great cost of persecution and the great cost of opposition whatever the cause you're personally made up your mind i have the truth i believe the truth i love the truth i've decided for the truth i've chosen the way of truth and i'm going to walk in this way we're coming to psalm 119 i'm looking at psalm 119 and i'm reading from verse 30 psalm 119 and we're reading from verse 13. In verse 30, here is what it says. Have you opened it? This is very important. Psalm 119. I said, are you there? Have you opened the verse? Okay, because I may tell you to read. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Everybody. God bless every one of us. He says, I've made my choice. Whatever other people do, Others may, I cannot. They might walk the downward way, the downward way, the way of degradation, the way of evil, the way of defilement. But I make my choice. And it says, I have chosen the way of truth. And it says, nothing will take this out of my hand. Nothing will take it from you in Jesus' name. At great cost. You make up your mind. I'm going to walk the way of truth. Only the way of truth. Always the way of truth. Ever the way of truth. Point number three now. The precept in the word of truth. The precept in the word of truth. We're coming to Second John chapter 1. Second John chapter 1, we're looking at verses 5 and 6. And now, I beseech thee, lady, I plead with you, lady, I exhort you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. It says, uh, there's no new doctrine, and there's no new teaching, there's no new commandment, but that which we heard from the beginning, we heard it from Christ. I was there, he said. I heard him directly. He gave us this commandment. That's our Savior. That's our Lord. And because he gave us this from the beginning, and he's still the same, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God says, I am God. I change not. There are some people that change like chameleons. They believe this last year. They believe another thing today. And they're never stable. They're never solid. They're never steadfast in the things of the Lord. But John said the same truth we had before. The same truth we believed before. And the same teaching of Christ we stood on since we came to know him. He said, sister, I'm writing the same thing to you. Continue. Brother, I'm writing the same thing with you. I'm pleading with you. Continue. We'll continue in Jesus' name. And this is love. 
that we walk after his commandments. It's, it says, I'm not talking of sentimental love. All that, you'll find the nightclub. That one is the lust of the flesh. It says, I'm not talking of eros. That is uh, Greek. That is erotic love. The one of the flesh, it says that one, you'll find among the sensual people, among the sinners. It says, I'm talking about the love that obeys the commandments of God. I'm talking about the love that is like the love of God himself. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye shall walk in it. It will be real in your life. Look at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. And here we're reading from verse 6. First John chapter 2 verse 6. He that saith, he abideth in him. Ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. You understand that? It says, do you say you're a believer, a believer in Christ? And do you say that you live in Christ, Christ your Savior and your Lord? And do you say that you are following after the Lord Jesus Christ? He that says he abideth in him, ought himself so to walk, even as he walked, that he is your ask yourself, what will Jesus do? Somebody accuses you of something that you don't know anything about. And then the temptation is to get angry. Hold on. What will Jesus do? Somebody slanders you. And then you come to him face to face. I heard you said this about me. Uh-huh. And so watch. And something wants to rise up on the inside of you. Hold on. What will Jesus do? You want to go this way, and some people they say, No, you're going to come, you're not going to come this way. What will Jesus do? You take another way because he was the prince of peace, and you must be a man, a woman of peace. And it says, If anybody says, I'm in Christ, I love Christ, I believe in Christ, I'm a child of God, it says, If anyone says he abides in Christ, he ought himself also so to walk even as Christ walked. I pray that the experience of real salvation and the experience of real sanctification and holiness that helps us to live such a life as a Christ-like life, the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 7, brethren. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. Here's John. He repeats this because it's so important. He said, I said it in Second John. Go back to First John. You'll find it there. What we are from the beginning. That's what we still follow. It says the old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which sin is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Verse 9, he that says, he that testifies, he that proclaims, he that brags, he that says he is in the light and hateth his brother, Tell me, it's in darkness even until now. Animosity in the heart, bitterness in the heart, hatred in the heart. Because of that thing, because of that time, because of that day, because of that action, because of what I had, you are not even there. There are you. There you are. Because of the things they said happened. I don't like him. You're in darkness. Look at verse 9. He that says he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. I will abide in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him we're looking at uh, this uh, first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 we're reading from verse 11 first john chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 11 it tells us in first john chapter 3 verse 11 for this is uh, the message 
that she heard from the beginning. You know what John is doing? He's saying, I'm the last apostle alive of the 12 that walked with Jesus, that saw Jesus, that heard Jesus. All the others have gone to heaven. And I'm remaining here, and there's nobody to check me up whether I change or I don't change. But as the rest of the apostles have gone to heaven, I will get to heaven too. And because he made up his mind like that, he said, what they believed before they died, what they stood for before they died, what made them to have the victory and the joy and the shout of praise when they were going, what they believed. He said, that's what I'm still believing. We heard it together at the beginning. They are no more here with me, but I'm standing on that. And that's what the Lord requires from you, that everything we've heard from the beginning of that salvation, of that sanctification, of that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It says, continued, that's why it says, for this is the message that we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Uh -huh. Look at verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil. And his brothers righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You understand that? If anybody hates you, although you may be coming to church, just pass it up for your mind. He's of the world, doesn't have Christ. That's why he's doing that. I pity him. I pray for him. I pity her. I pray for her. If she's manifesting hatred, if she's manifesting bitterness, you know, to fight with a sinner, that's a sinner, that's a backslider. And it says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Ye know, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother, tell me, abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If he dies in that condition of hatred, if he dies in that spirit of bitterness, no matter what you say at the funeral, he goes to hell. Because no murderer has eternal life abiding in in him we're coming to john gospel according to john chapter 13 john chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 34 and this this is what john meant when he said this is the commandment we heard from the beginning john chapter 13 verse 34 a new commandment i give unto you that she love one another as I have loved you. That she also love one another. If you don't love the brethren, our brothers and sisters, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, like you say you do, you are disobeying the commandment of Christ. If you do that occasionally, you hate occasionally, you are bitter occasionally, you say, because of what he did, because of what he said, that's why I'm angry. Why are you disobeying the Lord? Because he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that she love one another. As I have loved you. Look at verse 35. By they shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. I pray the word of God will be real in our lives in Jesus' name. Chapter 15 of John, I'm reading from verse 12. John, chapter 15, I we're reading from verse 12. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment. Has he changed? I said as our Jesus changed. Uh -huh. Love your wife. If you hear that she knows somebody divorced the wife, I see you coming to church, our church. Somebody divorced the husband, see you coming to church. And then we try to settle them. 
Oh, and she says, never. That man, never. The man is still coming to church. The woman is still coming to church. But they're coming from different houses. And they take different directions. And you try to settle them. What's the matter? What happened? I don't even want to talk about it. I hate him. I don't want to see him. If you die in that condition, any, anybody can bury you. Nowadays, they carry anybody. You can, you know, employ and hire a preacher that will bury you. But you're on the express way to hell. Because you have bitterness and hatred. And you die in the bitterness of and hatred. God forbid for you. I said, God forbid. Look at what Jesus said. He said, this is my commandment. That she love one another as I have loved you. Greater love as no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. Husband and wives love each other. Parents and children love each other. Pastors and members love each other. Workers and leaders love each other. Love is of God. Hatred, bitterness is of the devil. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to hate one another. Can God teach somebody how to hate? Can the Holy Ghost teach somebody how to hate? Uh -huh. If you have hatred, you have another teacher. Satan is teaching you something. And you are following Satan. When God teaches us, when Jesus our Lord and Savior teaches us, when the Holy Spirit guides us into the truth, he guides us into love. Verse 9 again, but as touching brotherly love, ye have not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it towards all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia, and we beseech you, brethren, that she increase, tell me, more and more. First John chapter 3. In First John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 23. First John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 23. Talking about the commandment of the Lord that he calls on us to obey. First John Chapter 3, reading from verse 23. Here it tells us, chapter 3, verse 23. It says, and this is his commandment. This. It's always been his commandment, and it is still his commandments. And the commandment has not changed. Salvation has not changed. New life in Christ has not changed. And this is his commandment. That she, that she should believe on the name of the son of the son of his son, Jesus Christ. And love one another as he gave us commandment. He gave us commandment. We're going to obey that commandment. We're looking at First John chapter 4 verse 20. First John chapter 4 verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hate his brother, if a lady says, I love God and hate her husband, if a man say, I love God and hate his wife, if a person says, I love God and he hates his neighbor and hates his brother, is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen. How can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. First John chapter 5, verse 2. First John chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know, 
That we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. We're coming to Second John, the second epistle of John to this elect lady and her children. The elder, unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Anybody here that knows the truth? I said anybody here that knows the truth? God bless you. You know, sometimes, and it says the elect lady, and her children. Are there widows in our midst? Are they have children? Their husbands are gone. Their husbands are dead. And they have no means of livelihood. And they still believe the truth. They believe the word of God. They do their best to keep on coming to the church. Who loves them? Who shows love to them? Who understands? That's an elect lady. Who understands? That's a selected lady. Who understands? Many are called and few are chosen. That woman is chosen of the Lord, is born again. And yet, living is difficult. Who is showing love? Are there women in the church that have a ministry? Women ministry. Elect lady here, elected to the service of the Lord, and elected to a particular area of work in the church. To the elect lady and her children and her converts. And then, just to announce the program of the women. And then the person making an announcement said, Next uh, time, Friday, we're going to have this program. And the coordinator and the group, uh, Pastor Luke, that him, who gave you that announcement? Okay, well, sit down. What's the matter? Because he announced the program of the elect lady. The church selected her, elected her, and said, this is what to do. The hatred, the competition between the man and the women that have the ministry in the church. And it says, we believe the truth, we accept the truth, and we love the truth, and we love one another for the truth. And then the program of the women going on, there's nobody to operate generator, and there's nobody to help us, uh, you know, get that and get this. John said, if I were there, but I'm old now. I cannot be there. And then he announces to everyone, says to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And then not only I, all the people that know the truth, lady, go ahead with what ministry God has given you in the church. We love you. We're going to support you. And he says, I'm glad. I rejoice greatly because I found of your children walking in the truth. Well, correct our ways. I said we're going to correct our ways and we love one another in the truth and for the sake of the truth in Jesus' name. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I'm reading here from verse 23. Proverbs 23, verse 23, 1, 2, 3, go. You see, John, John said, uh, John was about uh, 90, between 90 and 85 years of age. He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ from about the age of 25. 25. It's been in the Lord now. Jesus Christ has gone to heaven. All the other apostles have gone to heaven. And here is John from the age of about 25 to the age of about 95 for 70 years. He said, I got that truth from the Lord. I got that truth from the Lord and I bought it with consecration. I bought it with commitment. I bought it with my whole life and they threw him into a pot with boiling, boiling in oil and the man will not burn he said do what you want have 
God the truth shall not let it go and he passes it unto you unto me and he says I've been in this thing for more than 70 years and he says I kept it I bought it I did not give it up and he says buy the truth and sell it not you will not give up the truth you will abide in the truth you will stay in the truth and this truth that you believe today will take you to heaven on that final day in Jesus name when the trumpet shall sound the people that go back into error they'll be lost they'll perish they go through the great tribulation but the people that hold on to the truth of salvation and the truth of holiness and the truth that sustains us those are the people that are going to go up on that day of the rapture and thank god i'll be there i said i will be there i said i will be there Buy the truth and sell it not. Rise up and tell the Lord, I've chosen the way of truth. I've chosen the path of truth. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm going to follow him till the very end. Buy the truth and sell it not.